All right, what's going on, everyone? Thought we would jump into a series of events that happened over the course of the last week and talk about them. So most of these are going to be tied to the war in Ukraine, but we're going to spin off to the other side of the world and look at uh, some North Korean action as well. Before we get started, I'm going to pull up articles more as a prompt for some of these conversations than as definitive proof of anything. So, you know, these are all one man's opinion. If I say something that sounds fishy or sounds off or just plain wrong, definitely go check out other sources. I am prone to get stuff wrong at times. So we're going to start out with uh, what kind of led the news for a while and is still right up there at the top is the attack on the Crimean Bridge. So let's pull over uh, Google Maps real quick. I'll show you where this is. We've got Ukraine here, Russia over here to the east, Crimea in the south. And when we zoom in here, it's also called the Kerch Bridge because there's Kerch. Um, the Crimean Bridge, Kerch Bridge, connects Russia to Crimea. There's other ways to move in and out of Crimea. There are ferries, places you know across the Sea of Azov, other areas here the Kerch Strait, um, and there's still a land bridge maintained. If you remember when Russia took Mariupol, that was one of the big conversations, is the ability to have a land bridge all the way over to Crimea. So the bridge was not the only way in and out of Crimea for Russia, but it, it, it was a, a primary means of transport. I think I read that 15,000 cars crossed it a day, so it's, it's substantial. It's not decided yet exactly what caused that. There's a lot of theories going around. I think the most prominent one is a truck bomb. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, there's also consideration that it could have been uh, demolitions or explosives placed underneath the bridge and set off. Uh, there was one theory, I'll call it a fringe theory, about a missile strike. But if you watch the actual footage of the explosion, it, it, you don't see any sort of missiles actually impacting the bridge. So probably can rule that. Any real footage, I saw a couple photoshopped ones that were very clearly fake. But in terms of uh, verifiable footage, I don't think there's anything out there about actual strikes, missile strikes on the bridge. So the theory of the truck bomb has been interesting. Not going to speculate on that. There's people that are great at this kind of forensic work. I'll wait and see what they have to say. Uh, but something that would be interesting if that was the case is that would mean the person driving the truck uh, use that as a suicide device. Suicide, vehicle-borne, improvised explosive device kind of thing. And we really haven't seen that in this conflict at all. It's something we've seen a lot of in the Middle East, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and other places. But that would be a first-time event during the war in Ukraine, assuming that the driver knew what was going on and was, was complicit. Um, we'll see. Russia is blaming Ukraine. Ukraine, I don't believe, has outright claimed it, but, but celebrated the attack. And I'll go ahead and say that I uh, do not give any credit to the idea that Russia did this as a way to ramp up the war um, as a kind of false flag attack to blame it on Ukraine. There's ways they could have done that without actually striking infrastructure that is pretty important. Now, as a response to that, or what's been reported as a response to that, which I think is, is interesting in itself, a few days later, uh, there were missile strikes all across, missile and drone strikes all across Ukraine at a level we really haven't seen in a few months. When the war kicked off, there were strikes daily all across the country that really slowed down over the last few months as most of the focus shifted to the front lines. In the east and the south, most of the priority fires have been there. But on, I think it was on October 10th, these strikes increased in city centers, and I think civilian infrastructure is the best way to put it. There can be a debate whether Russia was targeting, like there was, I think, a playground struck, so you could, there's a reasonable debate to say, did they try to hit that playground, or did the, did the missile miss, and it's, they're not as accurate as they possibly could be. But either way, they weren't overt, I think the safe way to say it is these weren't overt military installations. There's a lot of military installations and forward support bases, logistics hubs, and things like that closer to the front. These were more city centers, um, electrical stations, power stations, things like that, um, more so than, yeah, military infrastructure. I've seen a couple numbers thrown out there on the 10th, uh, upwards of 80 missiles and drones fired, and around half of those were intercepted or shot down. I don't know exactly how accurate that is. A lot of the press around this presents it as a retaliation for 
the bridge attack. But I have heard some commentary, so I wanted to pull this up, that it doesn't line up exactly, that that's an easy story. I don't know how much this matters, but I wanted to throw it in here. The Atlanta Council in this article argues that the scope of those attacks required more than two days of planning to get everything in place and prepared. So it doesn't necessarily hint at, it has some ideas um, that maybe these attacks are being planned in preparation for some of Ukraine's gains on the battlefield around the Kharkiv region and down in Kherson um, as a way to kind of appease some of the hardliners back in Russia that were that are arguing to take the gloves off and to go all out. And what are we holding back on is, is some of the some of the terminology coming out of those more extreme circles in Russia. There's an argument here that these strikes had been planned and were in the works, and it just happened to take place a couple days after the bridge attack. Um, I'm not set that that matters so much one way or the other. Uh, I think the most important thing is that, or the most important piece to take from this is that Russia carried it out, showed that they're willing to carry it out, and to a degree still capable of striking um, really all across Ukraine. On that note, I think it's worth looking at, we'll pull live UA map up here. This is the start of the week. The dates are kind of wonky here, but this is October 8th. And I'm going to walk through the week. There wasn't a lot of movement in the lines. You'll see a ton of red here. The blue is Ukraine. The red is Russian actions. So you'll see some of these are air defenses shooting down uh, targets, drones, missiles, things like that. Uh, you'll see some air defense sirens coming up. But you can see over these couple days how much red is on the map. So not a lot of change in territory. We are very zoomed out. So there have been minor shifts in the lines um, just as there has been throughout the conflict. But really, this week has been a lot of Russian shelling, Russian drone strikes, um, and Russian airstrikes. I don't know exactly what I'd read into that quite yet. You see the strikes dying down a little bit here. Um, but a couple Ukrainian aircraft shot down or brought down, crashed. Go all the way to the 12th. Today's the 13th, so won't be able to get anything for today. But it does seem like the last week or so has really seen an increase in Russian fires, be it missiles, drones, artillery, and a decrease in Ukrainian offensive actions, which isn't crazy on the Ukrainian. It's really not crazy on either side. Uh, you're going to see these ebbs and flows in the conflict. Uh, Ukraine's taken back a substantial amount of territory over the last few weeks, and there's no military in the world that doesn't have to stop, reorganize, re-equip, um, move supplies forward, and so on. So not crazy to see that. I was a little bit um, surprised to see the up, what appears to be an uptick in Russian fires. Now, in terms of Ukraine, we're going to shift north to Belarus. They've been in the news all of a sudden. They were in the news a lot at the beginning of the conflict, kind of fell off. If you remember correct, if you remember the uh, some Russian troops staged in Belarus and moved south towards uh, Ukrainian capital, they were eventually pushed back, retrograded, uh, and that front really moved back to the Ukraine-Belarus border. And as of late, Belarus has started talking again, warning Ukraine. Um, Lukashenko, the, the president of Belarus, has talked about how, just this last week, how Ukraine is pl actively planning strikes on Belarus, which, uh, you know, 100% personal opinion here. I find it hard to believe that Ukraine, at this point in the war, has any incentive to strike into Belarus. I, I, don't, I, don't, know what they, I don't know what they would gain from that. Uh, they've got their hands full with Russia. They need to focus on Russia. But uh, there is a concern that, or Luk Lukashenko is concerned enough that they put together this kind of joint force with Russia. They're going to be pulling Russian forces into Belarus, and they've been, this is a very close alliance at baseline, so Russia has been taking supplies and ammunition out of Belarus for some time now. They've, they've been launching aircraft for a while out of Belarus and drones out of Belarus. Um, the Belarusian military is not, Substantial. They're not a game changer. It's numbers. You're talking about sixty thousand on or about. You can't. You can't completely discount that. That does matter. Numbers do matter in a sense. But um, it's a military that's not as well equipped, not as well trained, um, and not as large as the Russian military. So 
don't completely write them off. Uh, I think, again, uh, personal analysis, one man's opinion, I think probably what's happening up in Belarus is an attempt to force Ukraine to not forget that they have a northern border they have to protect, so they can't put everything into the fight in the east and the south. I'd be surprised if Belarus enters the fight anytime soon. Uh, in line with that, the United Nations this week held a uh, vote demand or uh, asking for countries to not recognize the Russian annexation of territories in eastern Ukraine. They called the attempted illegal annexation. Uh, overwhelmingly, countries voted in favor. I'll pull up the results here. Um, so what you'll see on this page is green. Make my screen a little bit smaller. Green voted in favor of, of saying this is not a legal annexation. The way to look at this is green voted in favor of Ukraine, red voted in favor of Russia, and then yellow abstained from voting. So um, the red ones, easiest ones to call out here, Belarus, uh, North Korea, Russia, and Syria. No major surprises, kind of what you would expect. Uh, Nicaragua, missed that one. A lot of abstentions tend to be from countries that are either closely aligned or you know, maybe arms have arms agreements with Russia, receive weapons from Russia. Kyrgyzstan, China's in there, Cuba. Uh, where else we got? Uganda, Uzbekistan, Vietnam. So a lot took the, I'll call it the easy way out, the diplomatic easy way out and just didn't vote. I, I do think it's interesting to show this graph, to show this chart of baseline because uh, you still have these countries that are not willing to go all in with Russia on the international stage. I mean, they're 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 walking that tightrope. We'll go back to China, especially like they are not all in and you know condemning this UN action against Russia. They're they're sitting the fence as best they can. Moving on to North Korea, and this is the last one to get into here. Uh, God, they fired more missiles this week. I want to say that's forty three total this year, which is a record-setting deal, record-setting deal, record-setting number of missile launches this year. And that's everything from cruise missiles to ballistic missiles, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Uh, North Korea said that this most recent launch uh, were nuclear-capable cruise missiles. And this was for about 10 days now, maybe longer. It's been this crazy back and forth. Uh, North Korea launches missiles. Sometimes just they do it for testing reasons, I would say. Other times it's because they're protesting drills that are happening in and around uh, Korea, with the U.S., Japan, and South Korea. They launched a, at least one over Japan in this last little period here. So the U.S. sent a carrier strike group back to kind of protest it. Then they launched more. And uh, North Korea eventually put on kind of an air display, ran drills with their air force, pushing out fighters and bombers, some of which are old, uh, really old like 60-year-old aircraft in some, 50-year-old uh, aircraft, I think, in some cases. But anyways, they pushed what they said was 150 aircraft in these drills kind of near the South Korean border, which was a, a pretty substantial provocation. Of course, uh, nothing came of it, fortunately. South Korea scrambled some jets, and, uh, and everybody went about their way. But this continues to ramp up. Uh, I don't know if, I don't know exactly the connection with Russia at this point, if if this is the path that Kim Jong-un in North Korea was planning on taking no matter what, or if they're trying to take advantage of the fact that a lot of the world is pretty pretty concerned about the potential for nuclear escalation in Europe right now to maybe make some, some steps on their own, some gains on their own. A couple notes here on North Korea before we wrap up. What they've been testing, including these nuclear-capable cruise missiles, they're not game-changing weapon systems. At the end of the day, the United States, South Korea, and Japan, the military might there is still substantially greater in terms of quantity and quality than North Korea. The balance is still heavily in favor of the U.S.-South Korea alliance. Um, but, you know, every one of these missiles that's tested is an increase in their capability, an increase in, in where they can send these, these potentially nuclear weapons. And we don't exactly know their capabilities when it comes to these. A lot of what the, the U.S., the West, South Korea knows of the North Korean missile system, North Korean missile programs, is what North Korea releases. And that's a tricky game to take what they say at face value, and then you got to figure out um, what's being exaggerated, 
what's accurate, what's not. One big takeaway I'd say at this point is the belief that especially their larger missiles, the intercontinental ballistic missiles, um, may not be fully reliable, maybe is the way I'll say it. Uh, that they can launch them, they can get them out, um, they can get them off, but their ability to precisely strike a target at distance isn't believed to be totally accurate, no pun intended. But I think that'll wrap it up for today. Uh, work on a couple stories next week. Just keep an eye on what's happening around the world. We'll see you then.